Welcome to the Artistic Finance Podcast, where we break down the wall between art and money. If you're here looking for how to be an artist and financially sustain a career, you're in the right place. Keep listening and join us as we learn about artists and how they make money work for them. Hello, everyone. This is your host, Ethan Steimel, here for episode 28. Thank you for tuning in. Today's guest is stage manager Cherie B. Tay. On Broadway, she has stage-managed Amelie, Getting the Band Back Together, Reuben and Clay's Christmas Show, and, before COVID brought everything to a halt, was working on Town. Additionally, Cherie is a voiceover artist, photographer, videographer, and musician playing guitar and ukulele. She has music assisted on the Broadway productions of Bring It On and Dr. Zhivago, as well as other workshops including Bronx Tale. During the Broadway shutdown, which we are still in for another seven months at least, she created a video of stage management calls to places and other headset chatter. This is for actors and crew who used to have them as part of their daily routine and never realized they would miss hearing them. As of this recording, the video has over 66,000 views on YouTube. We are seconds away from hearing Cherie's buttery smooth voice, but before we do, I want to take a moment and thank you for listening especially if you made it through last week's episode on modern monetary theory. If you listen to that, you now know more about the U.S. monetary system than 90% of the population. Everyone who has rated this podcast, or left a review, or subscribed on Apple Podcasts, or subscribed on YouTube, you are validating that these conversations are worthwhile. Getting artists to talk to me about money is not the easiest thing to do, but the honest and open conversations are invaluable. They give us insight into the financial lives of our peers, our role models, and other artists. Our art may be different, but money is money. Taxes are taxes, and retirement plans, or lack thereof, work the same for all of us. I hope these discussions remind us to take actions to review our financial health. Do we have a savings plan? Have we made a will? Are we paying off our debt? Just like our careers, it's a marathon and not a sprint. Take one action today regarding your finances, and that's one thing your future self doesn't have to worry about. Whatever immediacy bias we have, and this year has brought us a lot of things that require immediate attention, we need to set those things aside for an hour and review our finances. Let's check in with ourselves and take a tally of what we need to do. No one else is going to do it for us, so we have to take ownership of our own finances. And now, without further ado, let's get to our interview. Cherie B. Tay, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Nice to be here. We are recording this on October 15th, 2020. So we are amidst the COVID-19 pandemic and also the Black Lives Matter reawakening. Mm-hmm. I want our listeners to know that you have a website, com, which is spelled C-H-E-R-I-E-B-T-A-Y.com. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying that because it's super cool. And maybe people want to go check it out just because you have a lot on there because you are a complicated human being. (laughs) (laughs) That site links to my photography site, my voiceover site, and my podcast, which ended in May, but one day I'll bring it back. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Okay. I was going to ask about that. Is it like a limited series? Well, I started it at the beginning of the pandemic when, you know, you're just scrolling through your phone and it's like terrible news after terrible news. And so I told my partner, I was like, what if I just like read terrible news in a calming voice for people to fall asleep? And she's like, what? No. Like, how about good news? (laughs) So I was like, yeah, that's a better idea. (laughs) So I would find pieces of good news and then read it um, in a very calming, falling asleep kind of tone of like, this is what happened. 15 puppies were rescued, you know, (laughs) which was great. And then I rescued a puppy. So then that stopped because I didn't have time. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that's the thing about good news is that, well, first of all, good work on rescuing a puppy. (laughs) Or did the puppy rescue you, is what they always say. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But the thing about good news is that nobody really cares about it. Like, we pretend that we care about it, but nobody actually wants to hear good news. (laughs) I know. But that's the other thing is that I was able to find three pieces of good news every single day that happened throughout the world, which was a cool perspective of like, hey, there is, you know, there is good shit happening in the world right now. Absolutely. I love that philosophy, too, because it's like every year the world gets better. 
And every year it seems like it's getting worse. Definitely. It's, it's not. That's just the news. The news is by nature negative. Yep. But if anybody needs something to soothe them to sleep, they can go find your podcast. Wait, I know the name of it. I know the name of it. Uplifting News Unsad yeah. Podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they can go search for that. You and I don't know each other. There's a website called Be an Arts Hero, and it's a campaign advocating for arts people. So I saw you on there and I thought, oh, wow, a stage manager. And then I went to your website. Oh, you're a musician, a voiceover artist, videographer, a photographer, probably many other things that I don't know about. (laughs) Puzzle cuber. (laughs) So let's jump in by having you tell us about you. So could you give us a recap of your entire life up to (laughs) this point where you are now? (laughs) Sure. Uh, Born in Texas, lived in Singapore, grew up in Singapore for like a decade, and then went to a school in the middle of the cornfields. Actually, it was the mushroom capital of the world (laughs) or of the United States, either one. So like farmland, which was a big change from Singapore, went to middle school and high school there and then went to college in Philly. I did band, I did choir, I did stage crew. So all of that really started when I was back in high school you know, playing the guitar, and then went to college for theater and then worked outside of school. And then after school, I worked around Philly for a year, went on tour with War Horse and In the Heights. Uh, From In the Heights, I met Alex Lacamoire, who then took me on as a music assistant because I have music background. Through that, met another stage manager who took me on another show to be a music assistant. And I was like, okay, cool. I guess this is the path my life is taking. And it was great. I met uh, Ron Melrose, who then hooked me up with Jim Harker on Dr. Zhivago. And Jim uh, is really a big mentor in my life. And he took me like under his wing and love him. So from there, I met Jim. He took me on, kept going, and then worked with him for a while. While on tour within the Heights, I took up the ukulele because I didn't want to bring my guitar on tour. Like, who wants to do that? So, you know, shrunk it down like four times in size, (laughs) took the ukulele on the road. I started learning there and then got good at it, played for a decade. And then I taught the national tour of Margaritaville. Uh, I taught some of the cast members how to play ukulele. After college in Philly, bought a camera, bought a cheap DSLR and just started shooting. Same thing of... You know, I I was like, well, I'm not good at this yet. But then I did a project where I took a photo every single day. I would have to produce an image every single day. And I did that for five years. Wow. And that's how I that's how I really learned my camera. I just want to interject and say I have not done anything consistently for five years ever. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, there were breaks in there. Don't worry. After the first year, I was like, no. And I was like, fuck, I got to keep going. So then I kept going. And then and then at one point, like two years in, I was like, ah, I can't do this. And I was like, come on. And then I would start again. (laughs) That's amazing. And then from there. So that also was like all my camera gear, which could also take video. So then I my partner got me a gimbal for my birthday and I started shooting all of these films. And then I shot a falafel commercial from home during the shutdown for a (laughs) hundred bucks. Yeah, (laughs) I got to charge more. And then I also was a second camera shooter on a Broadway um, music video, which is cool. Yeah, that's amazing. And then voiceover voiceover. I started also. So everything like really started a decade ago. It really takes like a solid 10 years to like get. It's it's hard. I started 10 years ago of everyone being like, you have a great voice. You should do voiceover. But like, it takes more than that. So I met up with someone who does e-learning, medical narration. He like tried to talk to me about it in 2009. I was like, ah, sure. <laughs> and then cut to now, you know, last year I started doing more. I took classes. And then with the shutdown, I was like, well, might as well do this like full time. So here we are. And I'm still stage managing during the shutdown. Yeah? What are you stage managing? So I'm working on, I did a reading of a musical, and then uh, the big one is Theater for One. Uh, Christine Jones started that, and we figured out a way to make eye-to-eye contact, which is super cool. And so that's been running for a while, and I've been stage managing and technical consultant on that. Is remote stage managing harder, easier, or apples and oranges? It's apples and oranges. It's it's really, it's a a strange, like, TV production side of it versus in-person kind of energy, you know? Yeah. Could you, I think some of this we might have picked up, but could you describe your demographics for us? I'm in my 30s. I identify as she, her. 
I am of Asian origin, so I was born like Singaporean, uh, but my family, like my ancestors, are from China. My education, college, undergrad, that's it. Geographic background, currently in Brooklyn, but really from everywhere. Relationship, I am currently engaged. Uh, we were supposed to get married in August, and obviously that did not happen. So. Well, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. And what's your new plan for getting married? Or did you just elope somewhere well, now? <laughs> no, we're thinking uh, May, an eight-person outdoor socially distanced in in brooklyn or who knows <laughs> who knows okay that's too far away on our like anniversary day date so they'll be consistent congratulations for being engaged and i hope that wedding is amazing <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> <laughs> i want to get to know we know you a little bit but i want to get to know your creative personality what is a live event that you like to experience as an audience member a broadway period Come on. <laughs> <laughs> of course. It's my joy. <laughs> Before COVID, how often did you actually get to see Broadway shows? Because since you were working... When I was working, not much. But we did once in a while, you know, we got tickets to see Phantom. And I was like, sure, why not? It was great. It brought me back to my childhood of like why I fell in love with theater. And I remembered like the magic that I felt when I first saw it when I was like eight. And I was like, this is magical. For a fan of the opera, like what? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm with it. I'm with it. I love spectacle. <laughs> <laughs> what is a piece of art that you like? Hmm, interactive art. If we're talking like art, art versus like theater or dance or whatever, definitely art that I get to interact with, that I can touch and like move and fuck around with. Like, do you have a specific example of that? Yeah, like at Dia Beacon, there's like some, there's this one thing in the middle of the room that you can spin around and. It's an art museum. And I'm like, great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like another thing with swinging doors that you could just push. And I was like, this is amazing. Yeah. Amazing. What keeps you motivated to keep working on, say, those days that you wake up and you don't want to get out of bed? Most of the time it's other people. So like I was working on Theater for One and one of our actors said, oh, I really miss stage manager calls. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. Who? That's like something you hear every single day. So I made a video which like went viral that I was not expecting. And then voiceover, like I just made my e-learning demo last night because someone wanted me to submit for something. So it's really a lot of wanting to be better while also either giving back to somebody or taking in information from somebody. Yeah, that's an amazing answer. <laughs> It's very safe. No. <laughs> um, uh, what music do you listen to? Oh, Broadway. But, you know, I also love Beatles, The Carpenters, like old school, like Temptations, Burt Bacharach. Like, and then, of course, new, you know, I'll put on like my Apple Today's Hits shuffle and, and jam along. But if I'm really feeling anxious or like down... Just, you know, a good old Sondheim album does the trick. <laughs> yeah, amazing. I love Broadway people who listen to Broadway. It's, Me too. It's great. <laughs> Me and another <laughs> stage manager, uh, we trade cast recordings. They're like, oh, what are you listening to this week? <laughs> oh, also, I wanted to mention, just because you already mentioned it, your stage management calling video, that's called Miss Hearing Stage Manager Calls, Here You Go. And that's on YouTube. Yep. <laughs> and you released it a month ago and it has 66,000 views. I, it's bananas. It's so like if anybody is in theater or any live event, like you, t first of all, you totally know what you're saying. And then of course you want to hear it because you're so familiar with it <laughs> 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 and you haven't heard it. But also if anybody's not in theater and they, they want to know what it sounds like to hear a stage manager calling, that is exactly it. That's what you hear for an hour or two hours like during the show. It's just that. And we actually, I made, a, someone contacted me and we made ringtone packs. So you can, each file is a separate ringtone. So if you're setting your alarm on your phone, you can have like a 15 minute call, a five minute call. And for that, people could donate whatever amount of money they wanted to donate. And I would send it to them. And we, a portion of that went to organizations. So we raised $277 each for a Black Lives Matter and the Actors Fund. Amazing. And is that, is that still, are you still selling that? Yeah, it's still a donation based thing. So if you want to drop in, like some people, it's ranged from anywhere from a dollar to like, a hundred dollars. It's really bananas. It's amazing. 
So like taking that video, giving people comfort and joy, and also raising money for a good cause. Like It's also awesome. also what I love about the video too. It looks like you're backstage or in a booth or something. I have a uh, custom lights and gels around here that and it's my new lighting design side hustle. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So we sort of know your creative personality. So now we're going to get to know your financial personality. Oh, boy. I'll, yeah, I'll give the caveat that before you agreed to do this, you said, I know nothing about finance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not worried. It's true. <laughs> okay. So are you good or bad with money? Terrible. Just terrible. I'm like, oh, there's a sale on an 18-inch ring light. Sounds good. And then I suddenly have five lamps in front of me, so... <laughs> Okay, and I'm just going to ask, because you're engaged, is your partner good or bad with money? And did they accept you? <laughs> We're, you know, we check each other. She, She's like, oh, I just bought a dog bed. But it's fine, because we need it for the dog. She's actually really good. She's much better than I am, I would say. I'm like, ooh, I'm going to buy this. Click. <laughs> Where she'll, like, do all the research before she, like, buys anything. Oh, those people. Oh, <laughs> I, I mean, you'll be dead by the time you finish researching anything. <laughs> I need a toothpick. Well, I got to make sure I get the best toothpick. Let's see. Let me spend an hour looking. And then you click the one you think is the best. And then the reviews are like snapped instantly. And you're like, well, I can't buy this one. <laughs> also, I hate reviews because it's literally there's a review for everything. Every product has a review that says amazing and terrible. Yeah. And then if you get something and it breaks and you go back and look at the reviews, never do this because this is a terrible thing to do. But you go back and look at the reviews and then your brain automatically goes to all the negative ones. And you're like, how did I ignore those 200 people that said this was awful? <laughs> And the exact thing happened to the thing I bought. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. So I think you already answered this part of the question, though, which is, are you a saver or a spender? I wish I was both. I wish I was both. Yeah. Uh, half, half and half. I try to save, but at this moment I'm spending. Just because especially with the voiceover career, I'm like putting in so much money into it, you know? Right, 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 right. And then this, are you risk averse or a risk taker? Wow. Probably averse. Probably averse. I tried Robinhood, you know, that like stock app. And I put in a hundred bucks. I was like, sure, it's a hundred bucks. And then it went down to 77. And I was like, okay, withdraw the money and then just like let it sit. <laughs> and so that's, that's where we are. So you're, you're, you have $77 just sitting there, not doing anything. Yeah. That one day I need to invest in something, but I'm too averse to it. So... <laughs> All right, if anybody has an idea where Cherie should put her $77, let us know. <laughs> yeah, I should have bought like a portion of GM or no, of uh, 3M when this first started. Well, yeah, or Boeing or, you know, any, any company that the government will bail out is probably a safe bet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, vey. Um I see. I had a thought about that, but I forgot what it was. So, um, oh, this is this is what my thought was. And I'm no financial advisor, so certainly don't listen to me. But historically, the stock market goes down up until the election, and then it starts climbing. Oh. So you should put your seventy-seven dollars into whatever you choose. Okay. You know, near the election, maybe it'll get back to a hundred. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm. I'll do something today. Why not? Pop it in. <laughs> Apple. That seems safe. <laughs> okay. Uh, growing up, did you have good financial examples? Uh, no. Well, yes and no. <laughs> who was the no and who was the yes? <laughs> I, I don't want to like out anybody. So yeah, don't out anyone. We're talking about definitely some like stock losses in my outside net of humans. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But my, you know, my, my mom tried giving us an allowance of like, I don't know, like five bucks a week, we would have a balance book. And so she would put in like, start the week with $5. What are you taking out of it? What do you how, So how to balance a checkbook, which like I've never done. <laughs> Who does that now? Like we have, we have robots do that for us now, smart coding. But she tried, but still I, I would spend everything, so. You know, you don't have to answer this and I don't have to talk about it. But the stock losses, did those correlate with like stock market crashes or were they separate from like 2001 or 2008? Um, I don't know, actually. I think it was with the dot com burst and they lost everything. There's bus every once in a while and everybody loses at that point. So I'm like, whatever. <laughs> at the start of your career, uh, what did your finances look like? <laughs> 
So in college, I would actually do work study where I helped out the costume shop manager. And oh, actually, that's where I also started video. So at our college, we had to learn video production. And I started doing all of our college videos of like the ads for our musicals and interviews and filming and editing those, which was awesome. Like that's where that's where my my video background comes from. Um, so I would make money doing that to supplement income. Out of college, I worked at the Walnut, which was like 300 bucks a week. But you know, rent was cheap in Philly. And then at one point I worked in New York and I wrote, do you remember that article of like that one girl who came to New York and they were like, she's looking for an apartment and she only wants to pay $3,000 because her daddy says that this place is not safe. And I was like, who is this human? <laughs> I know. <laughs> like coming to New York being like, I want to be an actress. But yeah. anyway, I hope she's doing well. <laughs> Good for her. Good. Listen, good for her for having daddy money. <laughs> so <laughs> when I first came to New York, I subletted this place for like 500 bucks for a month doing a showcase code, which I will never do again. But you only did one? Did you only do one showcase code? Yes, I did one and that was it. I could never do it again, personally, as a stage manager. But it paid like 300 bucks for a month and a half of work. So I lived in a shoebox that Kevin Core sublet it to me thank you uh, my first like real experience in new york fifth floor walk up you walk in the door doesn't fully open you know <laughs> the bed is up on a loft the kitchen is like a mini fridge and then like a burnt toaster was it a studio well i'm sure it was a studio but they converted it into like a two or three bedroom it was bananas on that like i didn't have much savings at all i lived on bread and nutella and ramen like the person who recommended me from the for the job sent me a care package of food <laughs> to new york <laughs> yeah. and then i also went on craigslist and like got jabbed at some allergy test thing for cash and i was like cool all right <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, you know, not so great. <laughs> okay, so you didn't have a trust fund is what I'm gathering no, here. No, not at all. I wish. <laughs> you said you were in your 30s, but what, what year-ish was this? That was in the 2000, late 2000s. I've talked to some older generations on this podcast, and they say, oh, yeah, you know, I came with $270 in my pocket or something like this. Doing that in like the late 70s or doing that in the 80s, it's much different than doing that in 2009 mm -hmm. because of inflation and also student loan interest and all that. Which, speaking of, did you have student loans yep. or were you able to pay them all off? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> and do you still have them? No. Hey, congratulations. Yeah. When, yeah. Okay. All right. I, I'm obsessed over student loans. How much loans did you have? And then Woof. how long did it take you to pay them off? And when did you pay them off? You know, I could have gone to Penn State for $5,000 a year. Instead, <laughs> <laughs> I think my college was like 28000 a year or a it, can't, it couldn't have been a semester. I no, I don't think so. Because an expensive college, 10, 15 years ago, expensive college was like $30,000 a year. Okay. And that was for the whole year. And then I had a scholarship on top of that. And then so I would just pay into it. And I think I ended a few years ago. Okay, so you ended a few years ago. So let's say it took you like 10 years. Yeah. Is that safe, Fish? Okay. That, sound, that sounds good. Sure. I feel like that's a success story, right? Yeah. <laughs> I did... Um. FAFSA? The financial aid FAFSA? Yeah, yeah. I had that as well. Have you had any health challenges? I, at one point, was supposed to go to Japan with Warhorse, and then I ended up in the ER, so... Oh, <laughs> what happened? Well, my face blew up like a 400-pound chipmunk, and my throat closed up, and uh, there was liquid gathering there, so that was fun. <laughs> I was like, something's strange. This this doesn't seem right. <laughs> and they couldn't really figure out what it was. I went to New York Presbyterian and saw like the top allergist. And he said, you know, there's a study in Italy where 500 people, I think all around the world, have this thing called acute idiopathic angioedema, where just out of nowhere, your face like blows up and then your throat swells. So I had an EpiPen with me for a while. I had steroids just in case and allergy pills like Benadryl or, or Claritin or whatever day and night. Um, I've stopped those now, which is, and knock on wood, nothing. That's just like a one-time thing? That's hopefully won't happen again? Well, hopefully, yeah. Yeah, it, they were like, it could. 
So that's something sitting in the back of the bank. <laughs> just <laughs> just waiting for you, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, and then were yeah. you on, did you have health insurance at that time? So financially, it wasn't really a big deal? Yes. Oh, my God. So I because I was working on Warhorse, that was a an equity production Lord A contract. So it was my second year of Warhorse. I had enough insurance weeks for Cigna. And my seven-day stay at the hospital, I think I went back twice. I went to the ER, got sent home, went back to the ER, got admitted to the ICU, went to an M I an M I C U or an S I C U. I don't know. They they didn't have enough beds, so they transferred me to some sort of ICU where I was like monitored in a sol- solitary room. Discharged with meds, did all the scans, did all the tests, did like a plasma thing where they like gave me plasma and zero dollars. Amazing. I know. <laughs> like what? So that that was very, 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 very thankful because if that had happened at any other point, like who has money to pay for this damn healthcare system, you know? Right. Exactly. Man, that is like the best story ever because one, you're you're well, you're healthy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then two, it was zero dollars. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. I think the only people that could top that story would be like if they came out of the ER and the ER had like paid them money. That'd be the only way it could be like a better story. <laughs> okay, when you have excess money, what do you do with it? Usually I try and fund it back into whatever avenue I got it from. So let's say, so in the beginning when I started photography, when I made money from doing headshots, I would take that money and invest it back into my business of like buying a new lens or buying a new camera body. Same thing with my voiceover career. I did a Spotify ad for a friend. I did a real estate video. I did some other e-learning demo or e-learning uh, medical narration. From getting paid from that, I am buying a new microphone. I'm buying a new f- recorder. I try and save, but at this point, it's more like a balancing game of investing in myself and then hopefully getting some sort of gains with a Z at the end for that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Do you worry or think about money on a daily basis? No, I'm extremely privileged. I do think about it, but not in the sense of holy shit, where's my next meal coming from, which I am extremely privileged and thankful for working on warhorse uh which was a two-year touring contract i didn't have an apartment i was living rent free and just saving up production money yeah uh throughout your life have you used a budget i I don't know that word (laughs) (laughs) um yeah i you know i wow these are tough questions (laughs) no they're not (sighs) meant to be they're not meant to be i'm just curious (laughs) In my head, I do, I do definitely set, do set budgets because I'm not going to go out there and buy like a thousand dollar mic because I don't have the money for it. I do love a good deal though, so if I see like twenty dollar lights on sale that light up my studio, absolutely, I'll buy it. So, I guess if if you call that budget, then then yeah, I do budget that. <laughs> what is a fantastic financial decision that you have made? saying no to projects now now that you know I don't need to it's not that I don't want to work on a show is that my time is now more valuable in terms of what I want to do with it and what I get out of it so if you're telling me you want me to work for a week for $300 I just can't do that anymore yeah I think that's really important because it's just important because like I find myself every once in a while, I'll like a director will say, hey, can you do this for what you're saying? Like a week for $300. I, like I'll find some way to do it, you know, where I'll be like two of the days I'll be working somewhere else. But I somehow like make a way to make it work. Then every time I do it, I'm, I'm thinking I'm rewarding bad behavior here. Exactly. And hurting myself. And you're hurting everyone else who comes after you in the business yes. for saying yes to that low budget because- same thing in voiceover world, you know, that's why uh, Maria Pendolino, who who I love, um, says a rising tide lifts all boats. And if we keep accepting low paying jobs, that's what they're going to keep offering. Flip side of a good financial decision. What is a bad financial decision that you've made? If there's anything I know is that if I have any trauma, it just I erase it immediately. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you, therapy. 
Uh, financial, terrible financial decision. I'm sure there have been many, 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 many terrible financial decisions that I've made. When people make terrible financial decisions, I mean, whoever thinks about it, because like I'm asking you a weird question, inevitably, it's not really a bad decision because it's like if you were to go back in time and do the same thing again, like you would probably be forced into doing the same thing. I think I think you learn from it. And you're like, oh, I should never do that again. Oh, you know what was something terrible is that I joined in Philly. I joined, a, I went to a Bally's, joined a gym, and they like signed me up for some contract with some guy who walked me around the gym. And then they were like, oh, does your friend want to use the gym? They can have a free day pass. I was like, great. I, I you know, I was like 18, 17. I'm sure I was 18 because you have to be. And then at some point I I, I canceled after a month because I, it was, I didn't want to go anymore. And they sent me like a $3,000 invoice saying that I had signed a contract for three years and I can't break it. And now I owe them over $3,000. So I tried going in person and they were like, oh, that person doesn't work here anymore. So I couldn't even find the trainer. Here I am college first year being like, well, fuck. I ended up going to news stations like I emailed my story to news stations and this news station picked it up and called the gym and like talked to the people there and was like, oh, so you just got this person that and they're like, oh, no, no, no. You know, she doesn't have to pay. So I got out of the contract. (laughs) My gosh. You know what? If there's anything that says this is a great country. It's stories like that that just infuriate you because the only reason you got out of it was because you got the news to pick it up. Yep. Yep. Which is like good for you and great for the news and good work team. But what about all the other people who got stuck in that? Paying off like three to four thousand dollars. That's insane. You know, that's infuriating. Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> Golly, golly. <laughs> I'm going to, uh, I, I don't. How's that for a good financial, ter- <laughs> terrible financial decision story? <laughs> golly, now I'm angry at the gyms again. Boy. <laughs> Do you have any sort of entity, corporation, LLC? Not at Not all. Not at all. Okay. I feel like I should at some point with all the shit I do, but I just don't make enough money. <laughs> from it yet to to do anything with it. Cherie, I have faith for you. (laughs) And one day you will have enough money to create a business and only pay $750 in taxes. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) I'll just keep failing at building casinos and not pay everyone. Golly, golly. Um, Goodness. Okay. Uh, So most of the income that you get Um, Is it W-2 income or is it 1099 income? I have some W-2, some W-9. I don't even know what it, what is a W-9? It just means the taxes aren't paid on it. Oh. So you have to pay, you have to pay your own taxes. Damn. At the end of the year. Okay. Well, that's good to know. See, they literally (laughs) don't know anything about finance. I'm like, I don't know, a W (laughs) number? Sure. Great. Uh, (laughs) With, with Hadestown, it was a W-2. I did a W-9 with someone with like, I guess the online stuff. The virtual stuff I'm doing are W-9s. Um, and then 1099, I'm sure I do that on the voiceover gigs. I thought W-9 and 1099 are the same thing. When you fill out the W-9, it's so that they can send you 1099. Is a W-9 a 1099? The, this this doesn't answer it. <laughs> People ask, is a W-9 a 1099? And then it says, when it comes to re- time to report all payments you make to the independent contractor on a 1099 form, you will need the information on the W-9. It's the same thing, I think. I'm standing by my call that it's the same thing. Great. Basically what it is, (laughs) is it's money that nobody took taxes out of, so you have to pay your taxes at the end of the year. Yes, yes. Okay, which leads me to this next question, which is do you file your own taxes? No. I go to this guy, um, Todd Thurston, who does specifically entertainment tax. So he knows a lot about the industry and people who work in theater. Is that a plug for him? <laughs> Do you like this person? I mean, I, 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 I like him, so that's why. <laughs> okay. Do you have a retirement plan? And if so, what does it look like? I do. I'm going to buy a farm in Iowa. No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Away from mushrooms. <laughs> Away from mushrooms. Just a goat farm. Um, I have a 401k and an IRA question mark 
I th yeah, I think I have a Roth IRA. I don't know about my 401k, whether it's Roth or traditional. I know that I've been putting anywhere between 5 to 10% on my 401k from my employers. For one show, I put in 20% just because it was the end of the year. You know, I had already saved up enough. And then that show didn't pay anybody and also stole our 401k. So what, what? Uh, they, we got it back. So that my retirement plan is I have no idea. Hopefully my 401k covers it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So your 401k, is that through equity? Yeah. So you're saying, so every time you sign on to a new show, you have to fill out a form and say, I want X percentage to go into the 401k? Mm-hmm. Um, and then also, do they have a pension plan? Yes. And are you automatically put in that, I'm assuming? I believe so. I feel like I should know all of this, eh, but I mean, yes, I believe so. You'll figure it out when you're 65. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd be like, ah, fuck. <laughs> okay, so- What's annuity? El what's it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm gonna skip all those. I assume you don't. Great. Okay. I don't. It, annuity yeah. is something old rich people do. Great. So no. <laughs> um, yeah. And then same with life insurance, health savings account, whatever. What job of yours has been the most financially lucrative? Before the Broadway shutdown, definitely my Broadway gig. That was very nice. Uh, after the Broadway shutdown, I would say. I wouldn't say any one of them was financially lucrative, but so far I think I have made more money in photography than I have in voiceover during the shutdown. And is that doing headshots or is that doing other photography? I did a band shoot, which was cool. I did uh, a production shot for Theater for One, a production shot, virtual production shot for another show, and then did a musician album cover shoot. Not counting money, what is a job that you've done that you're most proud of? A lot of them, a lot of them. Musician or photography or stage management? I would say f photography, stage management. I mean, stage management is great because like I, those are all of my goals and I, I, I got all of my goals done, which is cool. You have like a goal list that you accomplished? Yeah, I did. I started in like back in college and I was like, I want to work on a tour. I want to work on Broadway. I want to work on a musical. I want to do a certain thing. And I, I achieved all of those goals that I want to do and more. Like I got to work at New York City Ballet. Like who, what? That was super cool. Congratulations. So. That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> nice work. Good work. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> this is sort of a follow-up question that I just remembered I wanted to ask and I forgot to. Um, but the original question was, do you have a professional network and has it helped you make more money, aka how do you find work? But that also ties into me asking about you being a musical assistant. Mm. I wouldn't call it like a professional network. I think it's more, it's not who you know, it's who knows you. You have to be good at your job no matter what position you're in. And from there, people remember you. Yeah. And, and that affects a lot. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Vibing with someone is important in the business, especially someone who you want to work with. You'll probably hire them more. So, okay. So earlier you mentioned that you were hired as a stage manager and then you were hired as a musical assistant. So as a musical assistant, were you working for like the conductor, the musical director? So I was working for the music supervisor or orchestrator. So I'd be doing stuff like actually like doing finale work, like actual music, music work, which is cool. That's amazing. Okay, cool. But the stage managers got you those jobs or like put you in contact with those jobs? So how it first started was... I did in the Heights for the second national tour and Alex Lacamoire did some supervision on it. And he saw me and he's like, you do music and you're organized and you're nice and I like you. You want to work with me? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> From there, I did a show with him and the stage manager on Bring It On said, oh, I'm doing a workshop. We need a music assistant. Do you want to do that? And I was like, sure. And if she didn't like me, she wouldn't have asked me. She brought me on that gig. And then that music supervisor. That's also where I met Beverly Jenkins, who hired me for Town. was at that gig in 2011. I love it. Um, how much of your success has been hard work versus luck? I would say that luck is when preparation meets opportunity. That old saying, you could get lucky, but if you aren't prepared and you're not good, or if no one likes you and does, and they don't want to work with you, you're not going to work. If money was not an issue, what would your life's goal be? I would travel Japan for like a year. Um, <laughs> That's not enough time. Yeah, I know. I, if I had all the money in the world, I would travel the world and like outside of coronavirus, I would go. <laughs> I would love to start an Anthony Bourdain series. 
of sorts of like traveling the world and like eating at at restaurants, like good restaurants. You can pay me for this later when you make lots of money. I think you should do a series since you've had so much success with your stage management call video. <laughs> you should go meet a stage manager in a city or whatever. Oh. Maybe shadow them for a show or something. See what they eat for dinner. Like, like, oh, okay, when you only have half an hour, where do you order your food from? Huh. And then like when you get out of rehearsal early and you want to go to dinner, what are the spots you hit up? around this theater mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i like that i like that blend that's great i'd watch it that's brilliant <laughs> okay i'll call you in the lighting design for us <laughs> or, or you could also ask this question of like when there's an actor that like asks you to order food for them and you don't like them where do you order from and when you do like them where do you order from? <laughs> always chipotle regardless <laughs> <laughs> say fair <laughs> okay what financial advice would you give yourself when you started out or would you give a stage manager or a musical assistant, what advice would you give them if they're starting out right now? For anyone starting out in theater, if you can go on tour, do it. Even a non-equity tour. I saved so much money going on tour, not having an apartment. Well, like a a tour tour, not like a one-month tour. Do like a year tour. Yeah. Is now a good time for students to be studying to become stage managers? I think it's always good to study art. I think it's such a good outlet for so many people, especially in this time where people are turning to art regardless of whether they want to fund us or not. What are people doing? Sitting at home, watching TV, movies, listening to music, playing video games. Those are all art. That's all art. Voiceovers, you know, that people don't realize it. But I think I think it's always a good time to study art. Whether you should completely delve in and disregard your finances that's another discussion like obviously don't take out a two hundred thousand dollar loan to do it but find a way to study it there's so many resources online there's community college or like cheaper colleges that you could go to there are events happening virtual events happening weekly of theater people coming together so yes you should study art but don't go in debt for it (laughs) I love it. That's actually like the best answer I think I've ever gotten. Yes, study. Don't go into debt. (laughs) Yeah. Don't go into back blowing, knee crushing debt. Okay. So big cities are artistic hubs for stage managers who are starting out now. Should they move to the big cities or should they hold off or? I mean, definitely don't right now. Unless you find like a really nice place in New York that everyone's moving out of and it's like a three bedroom for like 2000 bucks a month. Yeah, do that. But I don't I don't know. I don't know. Even with voiceovers like people are doing it from home. With the I, and a lot of artists are moving out of the city. Let's see. Oh, we sort of already answered this but maybe we weren't paying attention. Are you in any unions? Which ones and the pros and cons of being in said union? I'm in Actors Equity. Pros, health insurance, well, not anymore now that I'm not working. The board is made up of not the board, but People within the union who hold positions are most, I think they're all volunteers, so they're not paid for it. And we currently have a lot of people fighting for us and fighting for stage managers, which I I am all for. So that's great. That's what I love about it. The cons, if someone's considering joining the union, I held off on joining the union for like, for two years, actually. I could have gotten it after... The Walnut Street, after getting enough EMC points, I could have gotten it on three other productions that offered me an equity contract. And I held off because I knew that I wanted to do a non-equity tour. Now, if I had gotten my card, I wouldn't have gotten that equity, that non-union tour. And I don't think I would have gotten the union tour if I hadn't done that non-union tour. So it's like a strange catch-22. But when I was offered War Horse, I, it didn't matter whether I had my card or not before I got the contract. So... I got War Horse, signed it, and got my card. So I would say hold off on your card as much as you can until you need to. The equity showcase you did, um, that was before you were in the union? Yeah, you didn't have to be. And and But did it give you points to be in the union? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, it doesn't matter. I don't know. I don't just... <laughs> know. But we did have one actor, who, actress who was non-union, and they tried to not pay her. And I was like, uh-uh. <sighs> Golly. Yep. I, it, what do we need unions for, really? I mean, exactly. <laughs> I think the unions are great. Golly, man. Ah, now I'm just, uh, I get so worked up easily. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what can you and I do to stress the importance of finance and savings to fellow artists? 
That's so hard. Besides your advice of don't go into debt, which is brilliant advice. Well, <laughs> <laughs> if only I could follow it. Um, so yeah, it's that's hard because we all know we need to save. We all see it. We all when we are out of work and we're on unemployment and we have to go on Craigslist for jobs and get on state health care and do a weird question and answer gig for $30 cash where some strange lady comes to your apartment. You know, so you do what you got to do. <laughs> Speaking from experience, it's hard. You, you, it's a strange balance of saving plus investing in yourself plus being like, stop getting takeout every night, you know? <laughs> so save as much as you can, invest it if you can. But who am I to tell someone what they want to do with their life? You know, at the end of the day, it's your decision. But if you can save, do it. If you can invest, uh, find someone who knows how, because I certainly don't, um, and, and do it. So my advice to myself also is like, please, please help. <laughs> <laughs> find someone to help you. <laughs> yeah, which I think is like, is good advice because like people are going to come to you to be an actor, to be an artist. Yeah. And you're going to go to people to help you invest. Like different people do different things and it's it's wise to go to them. I wish there was someone in the arts who is good at investing and could be some sort of like mid range financial advisor of sorts. I'm sure there's someone out there. I just haven't found if you find them, please let me know. OK, I actually sort of have found them, but I'm not completely sold on them. <laughs> like I found I found more than one, actually. Um, and so, yeah, I've been meaning to have them on to talk. Um but also I need to do like some vetting because I want to be like, I need you to help the people that don't have a lot needing the X amount to start and everything. Like, I don't want that. I need you to be able to take like virtually anyone. But therein lies the, the rub of like they need the more money to make themselves money anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like some people I've talked to in the past, I was like, oh, cool. You do like hedge fund. Like how much you and they're like, oh, my clients start at two million. I was like, well, OK, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, so I it's good that you're reminding me of this because like that is something I want to do is like, OK, for people starting out, like just go here to this group or whatever. It's so easy, Sheree. You just you're so brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, I know you have to run. I know you have a show to get to. Um, so final questions. What separates those that have a full time career in the arts versus those that either start and transition out or never even try to have a career in the arts? I feel like this is true for every career, having a career in like three different things, <laughs> is that all of it, life, is a marathon and not a sprint. It really is. People who aren't working aren't working because they stopped or they had some sort of financial obligation or health thing. But I'm talking about people who are who are healthy and who are privileged enough to not have that to have that choice of whether they do want to stop or not. I'm not talking about people who didn't choose to leave. Uh, I'm talking about people who give up, essentially. And that's okay. That's okay. You don't have to do this full time. <laughs> you know, it's not for everybody. And it's sometimes not artistically fulfilling for everybody. I've definitely had shows where I did it and I was like, well, I'm quoting theater. <laughs> it doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't make you worse. It doesn't make you a bad theater artist. I feel like once you're a theater artist, you're kind of a, th a theater person for life. It really, all of those things that you do within the theater just carry you through life, whether you're a stage manager, a lighting designer, a sound person, you know, it it carries with you. And it's it's okay if you stop. But if you really, 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 really want to do this and you can't think of doing anything else, keep hustling, keep talking, especially now. You know, if you're sitting at home being like, well, what do I do? Go sign up for all of these virtual events that are popping up. There's women's, uh, women in audio um, doing virtual events. Year of the Stage Manager doing virtual events. Um, ETC is doing virtual events. So there's so much learning happening right now that if you really want to do this and you are privileged enough to be able to um, you can. Man, I love that answer. So inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> so inspiring and real, just real. Where can people find out more about you? I would say probably my website, shuribite.com, or I have shuribitevo.com. I'm Shuribite almost everywhere on Facebook, Instagram, 
TikTok, you can just look up my name. YouTube, look up my name. And I, I will recommend, again, your stage management video. That's Miss Hearing Stage Manager Calls. Here you go. That video on YouTube, it's two minutes. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Cherie, thank you so much for sitting down and chatting with us. You're welcome. This is a pleasure. Now I have so much financial homework to do. <laughs> no, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> that was our interview with Cherie B. Tay. My takeaways were, study art, but don't go into debt. It's cheeky, but real. You don't need to go into massive debt for a good education. Related to that, it's not who you know, it's who knows you. The jobs will come, so be prepared as that's how more people are going to get to know you. Don't work for low pay. Do what you have to do, and sometimes a worthwhile job won't pay a lot. But as artists, we have to live, and accepting low pay enables the idea that artists need to suffer to be artists. We can't accept a scarcity mindset, as that isn't healthy for our society. Art is valuable, and we can provide it and we must be compensated fairly for it. A special thank you to my patrons who get this show early and with bonus content. Visit patreon.com slash artistic finance where you can help produce this content for as low as $3 a month. Remember to check in with your finances today and take one action that your future self will thank you for. That's it for today. Until next time, break a leg. Thank you for listening to Artistic Finance. Find more information on our website, artisticfinance.com. Please subscribe to our podcast and please leave a rating and review. Artistic Finance is produced in New York City by Nicole and Ethan Steimel. Producing consultant Anne Nygren-Doherty. Graphics and website by Josh Cutler. Music by Chong Liu. Music by Chong Liu.